Okay, good morning everyone and, uh, and happy World Bee Day. So uh, in, in honour of the occasion, we have a special issue of the, of the copy morning this morning, um, starting with talks by Mark Clare and Tara de Rilgen about pollinators, biodiversity loss, and uh, Osmia aureolenta, which is a fascinating species of solitary bee, uh, whose habits actually intersect with my own original research interests, it, it, which was in mollusks as, as habitats for other species. So uh, looking forward to those talks. And then um, please stick around for a clay modeling workshop with Mairead Stafford um, and contribute to a fantastic art project to highlight the million species of plants and animals predicted to face extinction in the coming years. So uh, I understand kits have been kits have been available, but you can actually also join with whatever you may have to hand, be it air drying clay or plasticine or whatever, uh, to participate. So without further ado, um, I'll pass over to Mark for the first of the talks. Okay, hi, thanks very much, Tasman, for that introduction. Uh, a little bit of practical stuff, very quickly. Uh, I sent out an email this morning saying that uh, some of the clay might have dried out a little bit. So if you have a little bit of water handy and you can dip your clay now a couple of times while uh, I'm giving this short presentation and it'll just help it uh, moisten up and make it easier for using when we go to the modeling part. Okay, so uh, as it's World Bee Day and it's a great morning to be sitting inside doing something creative, I think, I'm going to actually start with a very short video that uh, was put together by Lindsay J. Thompson, who is also a member of the uh, UCD Stanley Lab. And the video is a sort of very short overview of how important bees are as pollinators. So hopefully technology is going to work with us. Let's see. Is that playing? Yeah, okay. Many animals function as important pollinators. These include bats, birds, and insects. These are considered one of the most important pollinator groups, and there are approximately 20,000 species of bees in the world across all continents except Antarctica. Bees are such important pollinators as they need to collect pollen to raise their larva and feed on nectar as adults, meaning their entire life cycle is dependent on collecting food resources from flowering plants. Pollination occurs whilst bees are collecting these resources, moving pollen within or between flowers. It's this pollen transfer that is responsible for successful plant reproduction of many plant species. Pollination is important for maintaining the global biodiversity of wildflowers and crop species. Of the 100 crops that supply the majority of the world's food supply, 71 are pollinated by bees, with the value of pollination estimated at 153 billion euros worldwide. Animal pollinated crops are important for providing a balanced diet, being vital for providing vitamins and other essential nutrients. And whilst not all food crops require pollination, some crops benefit from pollination for an improvement in quality and yield. And although many crops do not require pollination for the food parts we consume, they still require it for their reproduction so we can continue to produce them. Because of their contribution, to crop and wild plant pollination, bees are essential for maintaining our health and global biodiversity. So thank you very much to Lindsay for doing that. How do I move slide? Okay, so uh, I'm currently the artist in residence here with the Earth Institute. And uh, in my original uh, proposal for the residency, I had suggested that I would uh, research into the impact of climate change on the local insect population and uh, the effect that that would be having on our local biodiversity. <clears throat> um, and through my research, I learned about solitary bees. And in Ireland, we have one honeybee species, 21 bumblebee species, and 77 solitary bee species. And solitary bees are bees that live alone and do not live in hives or nests like honeybees or bumblebees. And one such uh, solitary bee found here in Ireland is Osmia orolenta, which is also sometimes uh, called the gold fringed mason bee. And uh, Osmia orolenta is mainly found along the east coast of Ireland, as you can see there in this map. 
And it is also the only uh, solitary bee that makes its nest in empty snail shells. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Tarek Dirilgan, who is also a member of the UCD Stanley Lab, and she's going to give us a little bit more information about this solitary bee. Is that up and running now? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, I'm just gonna move you guys out of my view, so I can't see anybody now. But anyway. Um. Okay, I, I'm gonna keep this very brief. I only have four slides, and kind of before I spotlight Osmia or Atlanta, which is today's workshop, um, I wanted to give a bit of context. So as Mark mentioned, um, I'm a postdoc in the Stanley Lab in the School of Agriculture, so it's led by Dara Stanley, and a lot of research in her group is around wild pollinators. So what we're looking at here is um, all the genera of uh, bees found in Ireland and Britain, and I'm going to use my pointer. So here's bombus, so the bumblebees that we're familiar with, and here's apis, so this is honeybee. So pretty much everything else on, on your screen right now is a uh, solitary bee um, families. And the context that I wanted to give here was that, you know, among this diversity of solitary bees, Osmia is here um, on the left. And then just, I have some links actually that I'll share with you in the chat, because you might be interested just to know more about bees and what keys you can get that are handy to have um, and some links to the research happening in UCD um, because as far as I'm aware there's also um, in the School of Biology and Environmental Science Julia Jones does work on honeybee genetics so that's the kind of two bee related research happening in UCD. Um, so Osmia this genus of mason bees um, it's a large genus over 300 species world, worldwide uh, there's 12 in Britain, but as Mark mentioned, there's only the one Osmia uh, in Ireland. Uh, and out of all these Osmia here on your screen, only three of them actually nest in snail shells. Um, nesting within Osmia is quite diverse. They mostly use pre-existing cavities such as wood, hollow stems. Um, and I just, I was in Rosemount yesterday, and I, I think this is Simon Hodge's stuff here, uh, but I took a photo just to show you because um, other other solitary bee species use kind of tubes to nest in. But so it's the same idea then when we kind of focus on Osmia or, or, or Lenta, um, because they kind of have a similar nesting um, situation, but it's just in, in a snail shell. Um, and I kind of thought when I, I have, I've never worked with this bee before, but I thought it would be cool to be able to actually visualize um, the inside of these snail shells uh, for what it looks like when they're making their nest. So I found this in a paper. Um, these aren't necessarily uh, necessarily Osmia, Osmia aurulenta. There are other, other Osmia species actually. Um, so only this top right hand one here, number 16, is actually um, today's workshop species. Um, but it's still nice to be able to see the inside. Uh, and when constructing their nest, um, these solitary, boo um, solitary bees, um, you know, they lay their, their egg in, um, in each brood cell and they also provide the kind of food to go with each egg and, and they close it off and they move on to the next one. So they kind of linear, linearly uh, lay each egg and they can have up to, I think, seven, depending obviously on the size of the snail shell. Um, and I guess just another fun fact is um, females, uh, as far as I can remember, get to decide when they're laying their egg, whether they're going to lay a male or a female, which is quite neat. Uh, and then just to finish off, because I said it would be short and sweet, uh, you can see this um, kind of green stuff on this snail shell here on the top right. And that's actually um, kind of chewed up leaf mastic that the solitary bee uh, puts onto the top of the snail shell. And um, some researchers think that this is a way of um, Osmia aurelante letting other females know that um, this particular snail shell is taken. 
So just a few facts there to kind of add to today's workshop. Thanks very much, Tara. That was brilliant. It was really great. Okay, so I go back to sharing. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Can you see that uh, picture of the of a bee? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So solitary bees pollinate more flowers than any other group of insects or birds, showing that uh, our plant communities are healthy and productive. And without them, mammals and birds in Ireland wouldn't have the berries, seeds, and plants that they need to feed on. And from a conservation point of view, Osmia Orlanta is considered near threatened in Ireland. And according to uh, Dr. Aidan O'Hanlan, who's the head curator of entomology at the Natural History Museum in Dublin, this means that the species require monitoring as they are vulnerable to extinction and may survive only due to conservation efforts. Over the last 30 years, up to 30% of Ireland's insects have disappeared. It's entirely possible that Osmia, like many of our native animals, will be upgraded to a higher risk category in the near future. So since 1980, more than half of our bee species in Ireland have suffered huge declines. And today, one third of our 99 species, uh, bee species are threatened with extinction. And the main, main reason for this is uh, climate change and habitat loss. And insects are the main contributors to biodiversity globally. And in 2019, the United Nations uh, published a report that uh, highlighted the devastating effects of climate change on our biodiversity. And it highlighted that up to 1 million individual species are currently threatened with uh, in danger of, of extinction. And I started to wonder like, how, how do you visualize uh, something like the scale of this kind of emergency. And this has led me on to, um, oh, sorry. So you might be wondering why, what this is, has to do with Osmia Orlanta. For me, uh, the relationship between Osmia Orlanta and the empty snail shells that she makes her nest in represents a creative and sensitive approach to living within her environment. And this has led me onto the project that we're talking about today, which is the unavoidable interconnectedness of everything. And the idea behind the project is to engage with as many people of all ages as possible to have a conversation around uh, the impact of climate change and habitat loss on our local biodiversity. And the idea is what we're hoping to do is produce 1 million clay snail shells each snail, each shell representing an endangered species. And that when you combine these individual snail shells, uh, you can, we produce an artwork that um, physically and visually represents the scale of the emergency. And when people see the artwork, they can actually then see the size of the problem. So obviously we can't make 1 million snail shells here today, but we can begin that process. And what we are asking you guys to do today is to help us with this project. And what we're inviting you to do is to produce two snail shells. And we would ask that you would donate one of your shells to our artwork because uh, we can't really produce this artwork without your help. Um, and we're trying to do something that can highlight how important our local biodiversity is. So, Let's get started, shall we? I want you to uh, grab a, a piece of paper and a pencil. And I would like you to draw as many snail shells as you can in the next minute. Now, they don't have to be perfect. It's just as many as you can do in one minute. So I'm gonna start my stopwatch now and I'll let you know when a minute is up. So go.
Okay, pencils down. So now I want you to count how many shells you could draw in one minute. Okay, so I think that gives you an indication of how big one million is and the size of the problem that we're facing into. So for the next bit, I'm gonna hand you over to Mairead Stafford now, who's going to give uh, us a few suggestions on how to make some clay snail shells. And Mairead is a ceramic artist who is based in Wexford. So over to you, Mairead. Hi, hi everybody. <clears throat> My name is Mairead Stafford and I'm down here in Wexford today. Uh, I'm sure you have lashings of rain in that moment and I'm sure you're all tucked up in your nice offices in the same way that those bees I'm sure are tucked up in their snail shells today because it's not a day for a bee to be outside at all. So <clears throat> myself and Mark have had many discussions over the past little while about the diversity issues that we have to face in terms of um, how we're going to overcome this huge issue and uh, my practical knowledge and my expertise is in doing a lot of things very quickly and and trying to make as many um, uh, to have as many people. I do a lot of workshops to have as many people to be involved as possible and to then make something that's quite creative and has a really nice impact and good impact in that as well. So my own work, just, just to give you a little introduction, is uh, I make ceramics. So I make uh, bowls and uh, little lanterns and things like that. And uh, so there's many different ways to make pots and to, uh, for uh, purposes today, we're going to call what we're going to make today a pot uh, because it's going to be made out of clay. It is a snail shell, but it could be any format. So there's many different ways to finish off a pot, which is uh, you can have a glaze on it or you can have um, it quite uh, matte, which is a little snail shell here, or you could have a kind of a semi finish, a semi matte finish in that. For your actual workshop, we're going to be doing a pit firing, which is a really cool and organic way to uh, create your work. So when we hopefully combine all our million shells, we'd have many different ways in which these have been created. So I'm really excited to do a pit firing and to uh, help you today now to create some really wonderful work. So, so for the first thing anyway, first, uh, Mark said that uh, we had to make lots of, um, do our drawings of what, uh, how many snail shells we could make in one minute. Now I did 33, which is uh, not too bad, but uh, for me as well, it's trying to figure out how, how can you quantify a million species that are under threat? It's something that for kids, for grandparents, um, I really feel that this project is a very strong visual and simple way to explain people how, how much of a major problem we're facing in terms of, of um, a planet and that. So for um, this side of it anyway, then the, the thing of being able to create something that's really quite beautiful and unique for each person, that comes down to your individual designs then. So with pit firing, uh, the technique that suits the pit firing the best is something that we're going to use is a very simple toothpick, which I'm sure Mark has given you. And if you don't happen to have one, just even a sharp pencil will do the trick in that as well. So these are ones we that I've made uh, just as samples before, but you can use many different things to decorate a snail shell. Uh, we can use a pine cone or um, a lovely fern leaf if you had it in that as well or little branches from outdoors now as well. Now today might not be the, the, the ideal day to run outside and grab anything from outside, but maybe you have something on your shelf which you can use in that too. But clay is a lovely medium. It loves lots of texture. Um, hopefully you can see that, that nice and clearly. Um, but it's sometimes the simplest designs that work the best. So I'm just gonna start off with um, a few flat pieces of clay, just to give you an idea of how to create designs. You can do it on a piece of paper if you wanted to, but I just said this might be easier to show you with a, a pencil and or with a toothpick and a board, the different designs you can create as you go. So with the toothpick, it's called inscribing and you can create lots of 
maybe abstract lines or something that's to do with, uh, it could be to do with the bee itself. It could be to do with uh, maybe climate change. Um, Sorry, Marae, could, yes, could yeah, you yeah. tilt the camera down a little bit? I can. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. That's, that's, that's great. Better. Thanks. So, everyone see that a lot better? Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is where for your, um, I suppose, your imagination, it's really uh, key to kind of have something that's that's relevant to you. And I might take a little bit of um, um, this, a little bit of developing the idea in your head. So what I would generally do is I would always create a little drawing first. So for me, uh, when I was thinking of a snail shell and how much life that that actually supports, I created little drawings of little uh, houses on top and trees and things like that. Now, obviously, we don't have the snail shell anymore, the snail in the shell anymore, but just in terms of things that you can think of that will give you, uh, make your particular shell your own and that. And that's what we're really looking for today is to kind of, not just to make random shells, that would be really great, but let's uh, maybe put a little bit of thought into what you're actually going to put onto your shell. I have just here, just to show you, this is actually one of uh, Mark's shells that he collected down here um, on the beach. And it's a, it's a really beautiful pattern shell. So it can be very similar to this, but it also can be quite different in terms of your own particular design. So let me just finish this one off here anyway, just to kind of give you an idea of uh, how it can be completed. So I always like to leave areas of pattern and then areas of, um, of plain clay because what that does is actually gives you a nice um, contrast and texture. So you could also do here a leaf maybe in terms of a pattern. Again, I'm gonna show you all this on the actual snail shell itself. And it'll just, It's just a lot easier on the flat clay to show you how it can all come together. So, and I'll do just one more. I have this, I'm cheating slightly, right? I have a really cool book here. If there's things you're wondering to kind of get a bit of inspiration from, maybe you have some nice designs, um, some really beautiful pictures there of birds and leaves and things like that. But so as you can see, it's a simple line, even these little patterns here, they're like circles and wavy lines and dots that you can create different patterns with. So obviously you can go along here and put dots in as well. So, so I'll give you um, one more one then to kind of think of. Maybe we'll do this one as a swirl. Now the clay will get a little bit torn, but don't worry about these little scratchy bits because they, when the clay dries, will fall off naturally anyway. Okay, so, so that's just to give you an idea of some patterns. So for your own clay that you actually have, you have a ball of clay that's like this, right? So this is what I'm going to do first. It's around about the size, of your, about half the size of the palm of your hand. And we're just gonna gently roll it in our hands just to reform that nice round shape. And two or three times is enough. It should be nice and moist. If it was a little bit firm, um, I, ho I hope you maybe dipped it into some water, not into your coffee now, but <laughs> into some water and uh, just to moisten it up a little bit. So it should be nice and soft and a little bit pushy when you put your fingers on it, okay? So then we're gonna create a cone shape. So it's going to taper at one side and be narrower at, the, at another side. So you can begin to see it's slightly wider at the base and narrower at top. I'll go again. 
slightly narrower at the base and wider at the top. Okay. So with this one, so again, just this is to give you an idea of how the designs can be created, but this is your actual snail shell. So we're going to get a slight roll here on this. And I'm just going to create some lines, the full length of my cone shape. Sorry, Mairead, can I ask a quick, quick question? Are we allowed yeah. to jump in during this workshop? Um, you... uh, my ball is really hard. So do I just keep dipping it in water to soften yeah. it up? If it's gone, it, uh, if it was uh, the plastic might have torn a little bit and uh, it might have gotten a bit harder. But yeah. what I'd suggest is dip it, like just dip it once and give it uh, maybe a half a minute to dry and then dip it again, another half minute to dry. And what happens is the moisture goes back into the ball again. And within, if you do this every, uh, every half a minute for the next two minutes, it should be then uh, pliable enough to use then I would think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so and then I'm just going to go along here. So I'm just creating simple lines all the way along the shape. Okay. So if you're, if you're, do you, I, I'll demonstrate a couple of these. So don't worry if your piece is a little bit firm, you can just be doing some drawings on paper rather than trying to manipulate the clay if it's too firm and not so. So then just with this, so we have it the full length of our cone shape. We're going to taper out the end and that again, just like as if it's going to become a spiral. So it'll taper out. And then you can see I'm beginning to form a nice tight spiral on it. And the clay is beginning to split a little bit as it goes, but that's creating a really nice design on the outside, okay? So there's our snail shell shape, okay? For our last little bit, I'm just gonna press it down on the base just to kind of flatten it here a little bit. And then I'm gonna get my pencil and go around about one centimeter into the base of it and go side to side and create that nice little area for the bead to enter in, okay? Okay. So that's my first one there then, okay? All right. So then I'm just gonna get another one here just to show you another way to create a snail shell. I leave this one here so you can see that. Is it okay? Is it? Can you see visually that it's all right? Do you want to bring up the camera a little bit closer? This is there. That's okay. good. Yeah. Okay. So again, the more you handle the clay, the more it dries out. So it's kind of it's always that fine line of not uh, playing with it too much, and then also trying to keep the moisture in the in the body of the the ball of clay that you have. So we're just going to gently roll it around in the palm of our hands. And uh, when it's nice and round, then we can start to make it into the cone shape again. Again, by putting pressure on one side more than the other. Okay, so it's becoming a cone shape. And there's our cone shape done again, okay. So this time I'm going to try a slightly different pattern. I'm going to use uh, something like a leaf design. So this is where you guys can um, practice a little bit on paper first, and you can come up with your own particular designs that you might like. So I'm going the wrong way with it. You could join the leaves together with some nice swirly lines. If you wanted to.
Okay. So I'm going to do one more little bit here. So again, that's the patterns that I have there on that one, okay? You can see there's quite a bit of roughness on the, this, the cone itself, but that's okay. That'll uh, blend back into the piece or will, will come off just before the firing. So taper your top again. Create a nice curl. And then gently bring in the shape then. Okay, and then flatten it at the base and then get your pencil and around about a centimetre up, create that little home for the solitary bee. Okay, so that's that one there then. Alrighty. So you can still decorate it after this point. You could put some more lines into it or some maybe dots if you wanted to. Um, that's totally up to yourself. You can also include your initials, would be really good. <clears throat> Just so that everyone has uh, their own name on it, would be great. I'll put another one down here. Okay. Can you see all that? And I'm going to put my initials then on it here then as well. Okay, so it's backwards to you, you guys, I think, is it? So, <clears throat> how is your clay then? Is everybody able to manage with the clay then? Is it uh, after softening a little bit? Tara, is yours okay now? I was, I was actually very generous with the clay. You could probably make three or four shells out of the amount of clay I gave to people. Okay, well, that's, that's good. It's nice yeah. to have the extra bit of clay. Yeah. If it, it, like clay is a wonderful medium. And if it, it has gone a bit too hard, or if you decide you'd re like to remake it again, it's very easy to break it back down and to start at it again. The way you do that is let it dry out completely. And then... Uh, add some moisture, add some water to it, about half a cup of water to it, and it'll reconstitute again. It might take a, a little day for it to come back that you can handle it properly, that it's not sticking to your hands totally. But uh, clay is very forgiving. So all the pieces that I would uh, chop off for recycling and things like that, I would uh, break them down and then we re reconstitute them again to be able to use them like this, okay? So the other things then I might just show you then too or explain to you is, um, let me see, I have, these are the ones here that we've just finished. So these are ones that have been completed a different way. Um, so this is kind of similar temperature wise to what you guys would be firing to. Uh, the pit firing will be around about uh, 10, 60 degrees. My own firings go up to uh, 1260 degrees, which is an extra, an extra 100 degrees um, in temperature. But that depends on the clay. Each clay is a different body and a different uh, temperature range. So the clay that you guys have is suitable there for pitch firing, and it'll give a really nice effect when it's finished. The wonderful thing about pitch firing is that uh, it's the atmosphere that really creates the textures and colors on it. So a lot of your pieces will be, have some really nice burnt oranges and browns and things like that on it. Um, these pieces here aren't, aren't um, uh, pit firing, but they are kind of similar to the colors that they will be. So you will get some really nice, very organic colors that will look very similar to these shells and that as well, the actual snail shells that you find on the beach. So how are people getting on? <laughs> can we can we limelight what was it? Spotlight people. Let's spotlight Emer. 
Should be able to see Eamon's screen. Can people see Eamon's screen? Yeah, we can see Eamon's screen and um, Ray and Evelyn. Perfect. And lots of other people. Uh, I, I'm finding, Murray, that the uh, dry texture is actually very nice for a crack neck on my shell. So. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting these up here a little bit higher so you'll be able to see them a bit better then. So, like, the, the lovely thing about clay is every clay is different. You could dig up clay from, um, from the ground outside and use it particularly for a pit firing because it's not as uh, sensitive as a, an electric or a gas firing. Uh, I use an electric firing here in my own uh, premises here. It's an old mill and I have uh, I've lots of people living above me. So an electric kiln is the, is the thing for me. I, I couldn't do a pitch firing here as much as I'd love to, but um, it's uh, uh, pit firing. So we'll, we'll, that's how people discovered how to fire pots and the history of pots uh, has been so recorded over the years through the ages of how people developed different techniques with pottery. So it's uh, when I visited Greece uh, about five or six years ago and, and the museums are not there, the history that they have in terms of how they can age everything through the pottery people had. And uh, as I say, ceramics is, is such a wide field. There's so many areas that you can develop and look into and you're constantly learning. So. So for myself, I, uh, for my own work, I would have um, uh, started off in Thomastown and Kilkenny and I learned a lot about uh, how to physically make the pots there. Uh, then I went to Cambridge then and uh, worked, not in the college now, <laughs> you might think I ended up there, but uh, I was in a, a beautiful market there selling my own work at that stage. And uh, it's you could it's a lifetime work researching into glazes and into different clays and uh, it's a beautiful medium to work with so so i i'm delighted you're all able to share with me today the the experience of clay so so um maybe i'll just say that what we're hoping to do is work with um our colleagues up in the experimental archaeology Department. And we we still to schedule a, a date for the pit firing. But uh, what I was planning on doing was uh, letting you guys keep your shells for the next couple of weeks so they dry out properly. And then I'll schedule a drop off date back here in UCD. Uh, and then once we have scheduled a pit firing date, I, I'll contact you and we can meet up and uh, watch that whole process at some point. I'll just make one other one here nice and simply as well when we have a little bit of time. So I'm just again rolling it really quickly and um, rolling it in my hands then to create the cone shape. How many people have we got today? Um, I can't see on my screen. And it's 25 of us, right? 25, fantastic, yeah. So we, we could get a long way if we had you all trained up then. We could get probably a quarter of a million done in a few hours, couldn't we? <laughs> so this one, I'm just going to use the edge of the board here. So it just shows you how simple you can create different patterns with shells or with clay. So that's just kind of got a nice um, spiral pattern on it. Tweeze out the end and make that into a nice cone shape. Okay. And then we can put the base on that. And then you have your hole then for your B then to go into. Okay. So these um, hopefully in time will actually host a lot of insects and bugs and that then as well when they're outdoors. 
as a child, I used to always um, go around collecting bees when um, uh, Mark is saying there about 30% of a loss of insects here in Ireland. Uh, like I remember as a kid going around and you'd be shaking your socks to make sure there was no earwigs in your socks. Like many of the days, we don't have to do things like that anymore. But uh, like I was renowned for getting my father's matchboxes and putting ladybirds into them and hairy mollies. And, uh, do you know, like we have lost a lot of our biodiversity here in Ireland. So I think it's really important to highlight whatever we can do to help protect things. And I saw recently that they're putting a lot of uh, bus shelters, I think it's Sweden or Finland, all the tops of the uh, public buildings are now being covered with plants to really help uh, promote uh, as much insect life as possible. So. Some impressive shell making going on there. You can see Evelyn doing a fantastic job. We have some award-winning artists in here working on this in, at the moment. No, Emer's not one of them. <laughs> Katrina, what are you working with there? Is that plaster scene? This is the clay I got yesterday. Oh, you got some clay? Oh, great. Got some clay, yeah. Fantastic. So it's, I've made really big ones though. They're like. They're, they're giant. Like two, oh, very good. You're going to use giant them Telephones. <laughs> telephones. I actually have loads of snail shells. Last time I went for a walk in the bog, I found like hundreds of snail shells. So wow. I have loads of them. Really small little ones. Not, not the same, not the same. Well, I, I meant to start the workshop by saying that no snails were harmed in the making of this. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it, most people got one of these in their kit and I'm not 100% sure what, I think they're really beautiful. I think they're from eucalyptus trees, but they remind me of like old cardigan buttons, but they're great for putting texture onto your clay as well, you know? Will, can we see what, what you've done there? Oh, very good. Very good, yes. That's quite large too. I forgot to mention that um, it seems like um, this bee like doesn't just make a nest in any snail shell, like there's specific species of snails. Yeah. That and Taz, it also sometimes goes for a marine uh, species, uh, such as a whelk, apparently. That's kind of good. Yeah. Trip to the seaside. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Beautiful. And are they known to be kind of limited by their availability of, of shells? Do populations mm -hmm. get boosted if more shells are put into the into the mix or has there not really been research like that? Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of shells down in Wexford, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I, so I would imagine there's other issues affecting yeah. them. I guess the My best. empty, right? Like they're not like kicking out the... No, sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's also kind of interesting. I thought that, um, you know, I'm sure there's probably more as near Orlando along the coastline. It just hasn't been documented, you know. And again, raising awareness about these things, but hopefully maybe yeah. someone might be able to find someone delirious or something like that, you know. Well, my better half, when he sees me coming home with a, another handful of shells, he goes, do you know all those bugs that and, and little did I think there were so many things living inside all these seashells? Would uh, that's their home you're taking home with you? I'm going. I'm only borrowing them. I'm just bringing them home for a little bit of inspiration. I'll bring them back all again. So, most recently, I actually did return a bag full of seashells to back to the beach again, so that they, the bees and everything that can rehibernate them, carbonate into them. So,
Um, so we've also got 195 school children doing this workshop today. It's two different oh. schools, uh, two Educate Together schools, one in Green Hills and one in Dean's Grange. So that's pretty exciting as well. That adds to the number. Okay. How many is that sh uh, in terms of snail shells then, uh, Mark? Are we, are we, are we halfway there yet? <laughs> we're pretty, yeah, we're, I'd say we're close now, Marie. Yeah. <laughs> Math is not my, my, my strong point, but yeah. Yeah. We've had over 300 people at this point. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. But I'm just noticing you're not doing any work yourself. Like you're letting uh, us do all I, the work. I'm, I'm actually making them and then I'm handing them to Ema so that she oh, can right. yeah, yeah. tend to hers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how I wanted it, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so you could certainly make four, four shells out of the amount of clay I got anyway. <laughs> okay, great. I'm just going to use this leaf here just again to show you different ideas of how to put impressions in. Um, I know what you guys have is, is uh, the toothpick, but it'll just show you again just how simple the clay can um, make an impression. So I have my cone shape in that here, and I'm just going to roll it across this lovely fern shape in that then. So that's the pattern of the fern then coming through on it. And again, tweezing it out. I did a project here locally in um, in Castle Bridge, actually, and uh, the centerpiece of it is a pine cone. Uh, it's um, it's called uh, the Jimmy J the Jimmy Joe. It's uh, like a an old dandelion seed uh, made from uh, cast iron pieces, but right in the center of it is a little pine cone. And uh, when I put the pine cone in, the, everyone said, oh God, the pine cone is going to be stolen. I went, that's the whole point, that the pine cone is stolen and the seeds are sent, brought to different parts. So we replaced the pine cone about five times now over the past probably, probably five months or thereabouts, which I think is not too bad. Whether it's birds that are stealing them or children, I'm not too sure, but uh, I think it's a good idea that people realize that they can uh, have a, a small effect and make a difference to what uh, to help re, um, reintroduce biodiversity to Ireland again, which is really good. That's great. Brilliant. Um, I was thinking maybe I, I could show uh, some of the shells that have been made already. Would that be a good idea? Not to put pressure on anybody, but um, I don't know. Do, do you have to stop sharing your screen, right? Or? Why just um, share it anyway? Yeah, no, you I can think go ahead, Mark. You should okay. be fine. Okay. So this is like a little kind of slide projection show that I put together for. So. So we, we actually have been scheduled to do a number of workshops, but um, obviously with COVID that got in the way. So we started working on a way of, of, of trying to do the workshop uh, through Zoom. And we did one in the, the end of last year to a group of uh, homeschool children. And that was like a baptism of fire, <laughs> learning, learning how to kind of present the workshop to a, a group of adults and children actually in one one room but it was a lot of fun and we got some really great work out of it yeah. 
and hopefully at some point maybe we can do some kind of presentation uh, within UCD. Um, I was over in the West Wing where they have their display cabinets and uh, I think that could be a great location maybe at some point to show the work that's been made today. Where are you going to assemble the million, Mark? <laughs> a very good question, Tasman. Uh, I mean, really, at the moment, we're looking at different ways of presenting the work because obviously it's going to be such a long lifespan project, you know. And this is this slideshow is one way of doing it. Uh, I'm actually uh, hoping to do some three D scans of the pieces and, and try and kind of create some virtual presentation that could go online as well so and that would just be we'd be adding to that as we go and then hopefully at some point we'd have you know different um physical sort of presentations in galleries or even in outdoor locations and things like that so as it builds we're going to try and work with it in different ways It. So anyway, that, that's that's just a few that we've got back. Mine looks nothing as good as those, but it's still good. <laughs> I have no doubt, Tara. I have no doubt. Uh, just on a side note. Um, I here in Castle Bridge is uh, the birthplace of the Guinness World Records. So, um, so myself and Mark have been talking about all sorts of other, of an idea of how you could do this uh, um, large scale art project and get a, a million people involved, which would be a huge project. So, um, so if, if there's any place it's going to happen, it, it will happen here. So it's uh, it's something that we're we're. I'm already trying to figure out how much clay we'd need to use and all the logistics of it. So, but it's, it's, it is a huge task, but that's, I think, how big it needs to be for, for the world to really see how important it is as well that we need to protect all these species. So, so it's, I think if by COVID actually haven't come in, it has forced us onto kind of the next stage of going, doing it by Zoom. Yeah. And if you could kind of um, get it to happen logistically, I think it's very possible. So and I mean, you could have pit firings in areas and kind of concentrate that it's not, again, done as uh, in a way as possibly as, as um, environmentally friendly as possible as well. So, and, and that's another thing we're looking at is like today, 195 kids, and that's all been basically done off a of video that we put together mm. so you know yeah. again it's about trying to disseminate the project in different ways but I see we're coming up to time so um like I said I'm going to email you all maybe in a week or so what what I suggest is that you um put your clay shells on maybe those paper plates that uh, came with the kits or somewhere on a shelf or something and just let them dry out over the next two weeks and then we'll get you to drop them back in and I'll organize the pit fine and get back to you about that. But to finish with, I wanted to say a few thank yous. Uh, particularly, I want to say thank you very much to Will Fitzmaurice and the Earth Institute, because obviously this workshop wouldn't have happened without those guys. I'd like to thank Emer, Emer uh, O'Boyle here from Parity Studios, who also has been supporting the project. Uh, Dr. Tara Dirigan for her uh, ongoing efforts with this workshop. She's going to do a talk with me now with some children after this. Uh, uh, to Lindsay J. Thompson for putting together the video. Uh, Dunleary Rat Down County Council are also supporting this workshop. So thank you very much to them. Uh, and a thank you to Brendan O'Neill over in Experimental Archaeology, who is going to help with the pit firing. And Last but not least, Mairead Stafford, obviously, obviously. <laughs> and last but not least is all the shell makers out there today yeah. and in the future. So thank you very thank much you. for partaking because like I said, this, this, this project won't happen without people getting involved. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank, 
thank you mark and everybody who's pulled it together it really is great stuff and really nice to be doing something active and hands-on in this virtual world that we we inhabit at the moment so yeah it's super and it's great to hear about the engagement of all the school children and so on i think it's a, yeah. it's a fabulous idea and really, not really really nicely done so uh, thanks very much again for, uh, for hosting this this event it's really thank good thank you for, for hosting the event too cheers <laughs> all right see you, everybody thank you thanks so much <laughs>